Jesse, hi, this is Dick Wortman calling from Boston. Uh, the reason I'm calling now is, uh, as you know from what I sent you yesterday, the European Food Safety Administration has now said that DHA does nada for memory. And it occurs to me uh, there are a lot of people who <laughs> make a living believing the opposite. You may get some flack for that. So I have a two-page fax I'd like to send you that just documents what the EFSA said. So they're entitled, Forgettable Science, EFSA Rejects DSM Health Claim for DHA and Memory. Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host and I am excited to bring you the 131st episode of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing betterment of your own brain and the maintenance, long-term care, and safekeeping of that same brain by any and all means at your disposal. We've got a good one this week. We're going to be talking with Dr. Richard Wortman of MIT, a longtime heavyweight in the world of neuroscience, as well as a practicing medical doctor. And he is the intellectual father behind a study of something called the Lipidy Diet, which has recently published two-year results from a study that's been going on in Europe that should last as long as six years, so just initial findings. But the hope with the Lipidy diet is to find a food-based intervention that can be effective for preventing Alzheimer's disease in at-risk populations. We'll be talking with Dr. Wortman in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, following up on last week's episode about chocolate incognition, as if that wasn't enough, I got one more piece of information over the course of this week, giving dark chocolate just a few more bragging rights. So if you're still looking for weaponry for your rationalization arsenal, then hang around for the end and the ruthless listener retention gimmick. But as usual now, let's kick things off first with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So there are certain drum beats that we just keep hitting and we probably won't stop hitting anytime soon. One of them is that exercise is good. Another is that leafy green vegetables are a good thing to have lots of in your diet. But right now we're going to hit the exercise drum again because a study has just come out showing that being out of shape during middle age will quite likely lead to a smaller brain later in life. This from a study published a couple of months ago by the Boston University School of Medicine, who just about 20 years ago did a study of 1,500 83 people at a time when they were average age 40 years old, free of dementia and heart disease at that time, and then followed up with them after two decades, at which point they were average age 58 years old. Now, if you notice the 20-year discrepancy, but only the 18-year change in average age, I assume that's because some of the older people must have died and brought the average down a little bit. But other than that, that would be a statistical mystery. The study was conducted by getting these people on a treadmill and getting them up near their VO2 max, which is a measure of consumption of oxygen per kilogram of body mass per minute. So milliliters of oxygen divided by kilograms of body mass divided by minutes of time. Of this measure, a score of 39 is considered about typical for non-athletes in their 40s. They followed this up with a similar test two decades later, and they also used MRI scans to look at the actual size of the participants' brains. They knew from the first round of testing which people started out at higher or lower levels of physical performance, and they also found out through the 20-year follow-up whether people advanced or declined relative to their peers as far as their overall level of physical fitness. The findings show several things, among them that people with below average physical fitness in the first test when the average age was 40 had a smaller total brain volume than the others at the end of the testing period. Furthermore, to tie it back to the VO2 max numbers again, an 8 milliliter per kilogram per minute change in that VO2 max number below the average performance level was associated with an extra two years of brain aging, as represented by a shrinkage in brain size. Now, as with many studies, this is correlative information and not causative, so they can't exactly say what about the lack of exercise might be leading towards the brain shrinkage or if it is leading directly. But when it comes to shrinking brains, you don't really want to take that much of a risk. So the advice from the scientists would be to err on the side of caution, do start some regular exercise. Dr. Sandra Bond Chapman, who is not involved in this study but is the founder and chief director of the Center for Brain Health at the University of Texas in Dallas, cited another study in which sedentary people 50 and older who start workout routines may see improved cognition and neural health in as little as six weeks following the beginning of an aerobic exercise routine. There are lots and lots of debates and worthy ones between aerobic exercise, highly intense anaerobic exercise, and even the concept of NEAT, non-exercise active thermogenesis, all of which have good things to be said for them. But the overall theme is that physical activity beats the heck out of just languishing around. And this latest study from Boston University School of Medicine seems to support that. So definitely get on out there, hit the gym, take a run, walk your dog, chase somebody down the street, whatever it is. Decades from now, your brain will thank you. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast where smart people talk about smart drugs. 
picked up a couple of five-star iTunes reviews this week. Schick from Canada said, wonderful and informative podcast, great guest experts, and a host who can connect hard science to the uninitiated listener. Make this a fantastic resource. And Didrikum, or Didri Kilometer, I'm not sure how that's supposed to be pronounced. This is a listener from Sweden who said, this is the only podcast where I listen to every single episode. Actionable findings in neuroscience and manages to frame it so it never feels like a chore to listen to. Well, that's good. Thank you very much. We never want to be a chore to listen to. Thanks to everybody who's left iTunes reviews. It's definitely a big help to the show. Helps us in the iTunes search algorithms, which is how a lot of newcomers to the world of podcasting find out about podcasts. So a big hurrah hurrah for those of you that take the time to do that. I have got less than 36 hours before I'm starting on the 2016 edition of the week-long water fast. We did that last year. We're doing it again this year. I think there's about 40 of us signed up for it now. So if I sound a little bit less peppy than usual next week, uh, it will be because I have no fresh calories in my system and I'm living off fat stores. I'll almost certainly be writing something about that in this week's upcoming newsletter edition. So even if you have no interest in not eating for a week, and I, I certainly couldn't blame you, if you want to ride side saddle and at least hear about some of the experiences there, allow me to direct your attention towards our newsletter newsletter sign up page at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. In addition to hearing me belly aching about how hungry I'm going to be, we've got links to other stuff going on around the world of neuroscience, a lot of the articles and research that we look at when we're putting episodes together, and kind of a little potpourri of brain-related ramblings. I've been looking forward to the water fast, and I say, I say looking forward in quotes, but it's definitely the last couple of months it's been a big thing on the Smart Drug Smarts calendar, but we've got more stuff coming for later in the year after this, so getting on that list is a great way to be the first to know as we've got new things coming down the pike. One listener this week sent me a fantastic-looking smoothie recipe recipe for coming off of the fast, getting some micronutrients and calories back into our systems. I haven't actually made that yet, but we'll put up that recipe link somewhere because it looks too good to keep to myself. Also too good to keep to myself are the Axon Labs stacks Nexus and Mitogen, which you can find on the web at axonlabs.io. There's also a shop link off the smartdrugsmarts.com site if you find yourself there and want to pop over. Nexus is our cognitive stack based around aniracetam and Mitogen. is all about providing precursors to your mitochondria to help them make ATP and actually promoting the creation of more mitochondria themselves. So a little bit of both. With the upcoming fast, I will probably be in low power mode myself during the second half of the week. Gonna try to still get some heavy workouts in during the first couple of days just to burn through the glucose in my system first and get into those deep stages of ketosis that's the goal for the second half of the week. Anyway, I'll stop talking about that now. We'll see how that goes. Still managed to put what brain power I have towards an aggressively awesome episode next week. But for now, let's move on to this week's main interview, which is coming up next. Smart Drug Smarts. So I'm about to be speaking with Dr. Richard Wortman, MD, PhD. He's the Cecil H. Green Distinguished Professor at MIT, a professor of neuroscience in MIT's Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. And over the course of a long career, he's got a list of accolades as long as your arm. In fact, probably longer unless you've got very, very long arms. Wortman's lab has generated over a thousand research articles and some 200 plus patents. And today we're going to be talking specifically about something called Suvenade, a dietary protocol called the Lipidy Diet, both of which are based on Dr. Wortman's research, developed a protocol for the brain based on three key nutrients, uridine, the omega-3 fatty acid DHA, which we've talked about before, and choline, which taken together seem like they may have complementary effects and potentially present a way to stave off Alzheimer's disease. But everything that I just said is a radical oversimplification. As we're about to hear, these are complex waters and who better to guide us through them than Dr. Wortman himself. So let's jump in now with Dr. Richard Wortman. Oh, and one last thing, we're going to jump into this with a bit of terminology because souvenade is something that is considered to be a medical food. So we're going to be talking about medical foods versus drugs versus supplements, just getting the terminology right before we dive in. So now, for real this time, Dr. Richard Wortman. There are at least three different regulatory categories that relate to what we're talking about. One regulatory category is, of course, dietary supplements, nutritional supplements. These are only for normal people. You may not make any claims for them in terms of treating any kind of a disease. You can't say, well, it keeps the brain younger, it keeps you feeling more fit, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it's against the law, and the FTC gets after you if you make any kind of medical claims. The second is what I'm talking about, and that's a medical food. And a good example of a medical food, you probably know this, ever hear of a disease called phenylketonuria, PKU? No, actually. Okay. Well, it's a disease, you probably don't have any infants, but if you had an infant, you'd hear about it because okay. every infant, their urine is tested and see if something turns green, it means their liver cannot metabolize an amino acid called phenylalanine. And if you don't get rid of it, then they're going to have cerebral palsy, dot, 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 dot. And the way it's treated is you make a diet that contains not pure protein, but the protein is broken down to its 22 amino acids and one of them is thrown away. Okay. So they get no phenylalanine. Yeah. Now, if you ate that, you wouldn't grow. You would do very badly. But if they ate the regular protein, they would get this disease. So this is a good example of a medical food, a food that is generated just for a specific population. 
what I'm going to be talking about is a medical food that is generated for people that have dementia or are likely to get dementia, people that good candidates or bad candidates for Alzheimer's disease. And the third category, of course, is a drug. And with a drug, the whole idea behind a drug is you can make medical claims. That's the defining characteristic. It doesn't matter whether it's a natural compound or an unnatural compound. It all depends on the claim. It's that simple. If you want to claim that I have done studies and I have shown that giving so-and-so to people suffering from so-and-so helps to make them better or keeps them from getting worse, then it's a drug. And it doesn't matter if you're starting out with sugar. If you'd suddenly found that taking certain quantities of sugar stopped diarrhea. I just made that up. Don't believe that for a minute. <laughs> okay. And you wanted to claim that on a label. You're dealing with a drug. There's nothing about the biochemical pathway per se that defines whether something is a drug or a food or what have you. It's just the label you want to put on it. So zeroing in now on your work on prospective treatments for Alzheimer's and pre-Alzheimer's, can you tell us about those studies and how those got started? Many years ago, I was interested in what can controls the production of certain neurotransmitters in the brain, particularly in one called serotonin, which I'm sure you've heard of. It's involved in, you know, appetite and mood and all sorts of other things. Yeah. And it comes from an amino acid called tryptophan. And the enzymes then act in the tryptophan and generate the serotonin. And I noted that one of the enzymes involved is kind of like a weak magnet. It doesn't really have much attraction for tryptophan. So you have to have very high concentrations of tryptophan locally in order to activate the enzyme and make more of the serotonin. And I did some studies that showed that, yeah, if you increase serotonin concentration, if you gave rats tryptophan, you would get more serotonin. And then I asked, well, what might increase tryptophan in the brain? And tryptophan uptake into the brain depended on blood levels, but also other amino acids compete with tryptophan. And so if you gave rats carbohydrates to eat, which cause insulin to be secreted, that lowers the levels of the competition. And as a consequence, more tryptophan gets into the brain and you get more serotonin. And that kind of opened, I think, the field basically of showing that individual foods could quite normally control the production of key brain chemicals like some of the neurotransmitters because they're made by enzymes that are weak magnets. Okay, so ever since that time, I've been looking around for other biochemical processes in the brain, the rates of which might be controlled by the availability of the substrate, the precursor, the thing that they act on to make their product. And I found it for a bunch of other neurotransmitters. Then I got interested in a category of chemical called phosphatides. And phosphatides are lipid compounds, but they're made in the brain, they're made in all cells, and they're the major constituent of membranes. And there are three key constituents. And so my laboratory found that if you give each of these three constituents, you can increase the rate of producing the final product, phosphatidylcholine, lecithin, phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylethanolamine, etc. Okay, that was extraordinary because now we have big increases in the main constituent of membranes. Well, what about the other constituents of membranes? Well, the other constituents are certain proteins. For example, the proteins and synapses that make the transmitters and that receive the transmitters and so forth. And then it turned out we were very lucky because one of the precursors, one of the things you had to give, uridine, which affects the rate of producing this lipid component, this fatty component, is also something that activates receptors, we call them, in the brain. And by doing so, it turns on the production of these key proteins. So when you're giving this this cocktail that we'll talk about, not only do you get more of the lipid component of the membranes, but also you get more of a particular uh, protein component. So you're making really more active membrane. Then I began thinking, well, what about membranes in the brain that are likely to turn over pretty quickly, like synaptic membranes? Right. Is there any possibility that by giving these compounds, you can get more synapses? Well, you couldn't study this directly in people, you know, they're quite alive. Eventually, people did figure out a way of studying it in people. And uh, it's done by using uh, complicated electroencephalographic techniques. But anyhow, at the time, what we had to do was basically to look for the intermediate anatomic thing, the thing that's intermediate in making a synapse. It's called a dendritic spine. And you have to have dendritic spines to make most of the synapses in the brain. And if you have a dendritic spine, the odds are 95% that will wind up becoming a synapse. It's a quick interruption just so people can sort of visualize this. Is a dendritic spine, should we think of that as essentially like prong of an antler? That's a good idea. Yeah, exactly. You have a dendrite coming out from the cell, the receiving cell, and then it produces a structure, this dendritic spine. It has a lot of different proteins inside it, et cetera. And when stimulated by the transmitter released from what will be the presynaptic cell, you make more of these dendritic spines. And then if there's enough stimulation, if enough calcium comes in, then you'll start making more dendritic spines and you'll start making more synapses. So, hey, hey, now we got something here. So that giving compounds, most of which are in foods, will actually increase the production of dendritic spines, which almost certainly will increase the production of synapses, and there's no argument against that. 
Then my trustee graduate students did some studies on rats to demonstrate that if you measured the rate at which rats learn things, for instance, you use something called a Morris water maze. You have a big tub, okay? And the tub is filled with water high enough so that the rat can't stand up in it. But in the middle of the tub, you put a platform. So if the rat is smart, it'll swim over to the platform, stand at the platform, and then it won't be bothered by the water. Well, you do that on successive days, and the rat gets smarter and smarter and smarter. It's highly motivated to escape the water. And we found that if we give these animals for a couple of weeks, these precursor compounds, these things that are needed to make the phosphatides and to turn on production of the proteins, they actually do learn faster. Well, at that point, of course, I got to wondering about people. Now, I have a dual career. Half of me is a basic scientist, okay, with a laboratory and graduate students and postdocs and so forth, working on rats and mice and cells and culture. The other half of me is I'm a medical doctor with some training in neurology. And so I have kind of a dual career. And once we're fortunate enough to find in animals, to find in the laboratory that, hey, if you give more of A, you get more of B, then I can ask the question, is there some clinical circumstance in which you'd like to have more of B? Is there some disease that is not adequately treated because you don't have enough B? And so might, that, might patients with that disease be helped if we gave these precursors and made more B? Well, the immediate one I thought about was Alzheimer's disease because I've been interested in that for a long time anyhow. And I've been interested in the possibility that, you know, these patients have Alzheimer's, they have too few synapses. That's why they have memory disturbances early on. Not because they have too few neurons. They do lose neurons much later on and their brains shrink, which is not a good thing, okay? But early on, for the first N years, their problem is inadequate number of synapses. So now if we have a strategy that increases synapse formation in experimental animals, might it also work in people, and might it also work in people with diseases like Alzheimer's that have a deficiency in synapses, and as a consequence, might they remember better? Now we got some indirect measurements using scanning, et cetera, that suggested this was possible. So in order to go ahead and have tests done on this, now you're talking big money, okay? This is not something that universities can do. Up to this time, all of my research had been within MIT and Harvard Medical School, and it had all been funded, thank you, by the National Institutes of Health. No corporate connections, et cetera, all kind of basic science stuff. But in order to go ahead and get this tested, firstly, my university said, we've got to go ahead and patent it. So MIT did go ahead and patented stuff I've been telling you about. And then there was a question of, with the patents, finding a company that would be interested, a licensee, a company that would license the patents, and then be interested in setting up and sponsoring clinical trials to see whether or not it actually worked in people. I was very lucky, found a company that was interested in doing that. It's a company that I'm sure you must be a client of. Do you eat yogurt? On occasion. Well, the company is Danon, Danon Yogurt. Okay, right. But Danon is known as Danone, D-A-N-O-N-E. Yeah, Europe. they're one of the world's major food brands. Well, indeed they are. But in addition to that, they have a very big multi-billion dollar component called medical foods or foods for special medical purposes. So they already had an interest in producing this category of compound. They had some experience with it. So I began collaborating with them and they funded two large-scale clinical trials on people that had early Alzheimer's disease. And it worked fine. It stopped the progression of loss of cognition, loss of memory, particularly in these people. But these were short-term studies, like three months and six months studies, and they were not terribly large, but at least they, they suggested, hey, there might very, very well be something there. Well, what happened with a recent study is this. The European Union, which is a government agency, it's not a company, right? The European Union decided for its own purposes that there's an increasing toll of, of, of Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of dementia as well. And that's terrible for the people that have it and for their families, but also it's terrible for society because so many of these people wind up in nursing homes for years and years and years. And if they can do something to increase the amount of knowledge about the disease and maybe come up with something that at the very least slows the disease, that would benefit everybody. So they had a competition and the company Danone, Danone has a branch called Nutritia. Nutritia is the branch that does medical foods. They submitted and applied for, I had nothing to do with this, but I was delighted to hear about it, proposal that uh, a study be done. The study is called the Lipidy Diet. L-I-P-I-D, -I -I, capital D-I-E-T, I, I don't know who named it. The Lipidy Diet Dr. Study. Came up with from Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss, okay, that's what it sounds like. Lipidy Diet Study. And what happened was just this past week, the first presentation was made at a, one of the regular international Alzheimer's disease meetings called the Springfield Meeting. Because originally they took place in Springfield, Illinois, but now they're all over. This one was in Athens this past time. And they demonstrated had, had, with data from two years that if they took people who they knew had a very good or very bad chance of developing Alzheimer's and gave them this stuff for the two years, 
it protected them against most of the memory loss. And most striking, I'm really shocked by this, it protected them against the shrinkage of the brain. Not totally, but about 38, 40%. I'd like to try to figure out how it works, but that is a kind of a big deal. And the study will go on for another three or four more years because the stuff had no toxicity, it never has, and the compliance is excellent. And people in the placebo, they don't know they're in the placebo group. I don't either. Placebo or the treatment, they all want to stay in. So they'll probably wind up having data on it for six years. It's really kind of a wonderful thing. That's fantastic. How many people were involved in the study, or I guess still are involved in the study? 300 or 317, something like that. I have a policy. I never get involved in clinical trials or things I invent. Because I figure, look, if it works for me but doesn't work for other people, what good is it? The way this clinical trial is being done, the way they're all done, is a group of scientists get together and generate a common protocol. And then they decide how many subjects they'll need in order to have a statistical chance of demonstrating an effect if it's there. It's called powering the study. And then they try to engage other laboratories to participate. So in this case, there were either 17 or 19, I forget which other studies, all in Europe or Israel, all over. This is European Union that funded it. And all the data are pooled and the investigators and the subjects have no idea if they are placebo treated or receive the active stuff. And I can affirm they having no idea because, look, I'm the inventor, right? <laughs> right. I had no idea at all until a week ago in Athens. So it's, that's how they're done. You want people basically that have trouble remembering events, but are not that have sufficient deterioration so that their memory scores are low enough so that they're categorized as demented. They're not demented. But all these same people, they have to have something we call biomarkers. And that's kind of new. Changes, you know, based on imaging or based on chemical measurements that tend to correlate with incipient or prodromal or developing Alzheimer's disease. So in order to be admitted to the program, somebody could not have the disease, but they had to have some kind of memory problem, mild memory problem, plus biomarkers. And it took a long time to find the people for this. That's why they had 17 or 18 or 19 groups. What, what was the average age in this cohort? I think it started out somewhat younger than one would have expected. It started out, I think, people in their 60s, but I'm not sure. For the food protocol, what percent of a person's diet is actually made up by the protocol calorically? Is this just a mouthful of something once a day, or is this a major part of the way a person eats? Well, the product is called Suvenade, S-O-U-V-E-N-A-I-D, and it comes in a snazzy plastic bottle, 125 ml. I think. Lactose free. Doesn't taste too bad either. 125 ml, you know, I'd rather it was zero calories, but you can't do that. And one takes one of these every day. As an inventor, I'm fortunate because I'm the only person in America, I think, that has had access to this. The only person besides my wife, she also. So it's been like five or six years now. And are we smarter than we were? I don't know, but at least we're not dumber. So that's something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we are. I just don't realize it. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the things that are in it. I mean, I guess it's really just three ingredients, right? Well, there are more. The main three ingredients which is really all you absolutely need, plus some others, and I'll tell you why, buttress it to make it stronger. Okay. Of the three main ingredients, two of them you can get from the diet. You can get choline by eating. You're filled with, you know, egg yolks and certain meats. DHA, docosahexanoic acid, I'm sure you know all about that. You can get that also from eating various foods. But the third one, the most interesting one, you can't. And regardless of what you may read on the internet about tomatoes being da 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 no, there is nothing that normal adult people ever eat that raises blood uridine levels or UMP levels. What's the reason for that? The reason for that, and this was shown at Yale 25 years ago, most of the uridine in foods is in the form of RNA. And you know RNA, obviously, for right uridine. Nucleic acid. Exactly. That is not bioavailable. It's all broken down. It does not liberate free uridine into the circulation. So you can eat your fill of foods that are rich in RNA. And in fact, most of the foods you eat contain RNA, right? But they will not raise your blood uridine level. Now, the great exception to that happens in infancy. You're going to like this story, I think. <laughs> because in infancy, uh, babies drink mother's milk. Or they drink inf infant formula. And mother's milk contains uridine in a different chemical form. Besides RNA, it contains uridine as the thing we put into suvenate, UMP, uridine monophosphate. That is bioavailable. So at the time when people are making synapses at the fastest rate, they get much larger amounts of uridine, you know, per kilogram body weight than you or I do because they can get it from the constituents of mother's milk. It's also present in all of the infant formulas, I gather, that are sold in America. They were put in 20, 25 years ago. They call uridine a constituently essential nutrient. The reason they put it in had nothing to do with the rain. The reason they put it in is that somebody had discovered that the maturation of immune cells in the intestines requires the presence of, of uridine. So by happy coincidence, if infants get it either way, they either get it from mother's milk, from drinking the infant formulas. Now, can you have uridine in your blood? Well, where does it come from? And the answer is, it's made in the liver kind of like a hormone. The liver makes and it secretes UMP. 
And there it goes, perky along. You always have it in your blood, as far as we can tell. It's just there's nothing you can do to raise it unless you eventually get to get suvenate, right? Drink mother's milk, which is not very likely to happen very often. Now, it is possible to get supplemental uridine in capsule format. Is that bioavailable in the way that the infant formula in the mother's milk is? No, uridine by itself isn't, no. The other thing is this. The big danger is the, the a protocol was developed. And that protocol was tested and was found to be useful and will continue to be. But anytime you, you mess around with a protocol, then you're way up by yourself in left field. There is no evidence, for instance, at this point, that giving these three compounds alone would be useful because that's not the way the study was done. If you look at the label in a bottle of souvenir, you find there were other things in it. For example, one of the things you need is dietary choline. I've been working on choline for a very long time, and early on we kind of discovered we couldn't give people high doses of choline. Why not? Because when you get above maybe half a gram of choline per day, much of it is broken down in the intestine by bacteria that generates something called trimethylamine, and that is what makes a rotten fish smell like a rotten fish. Oh, no. So there was a big problem with compliance, and <laughs> you couldn't really do a study on it. So then when we found that, you know, the liver normally makes choline. You don't get it just from your diet. You also get it from the liver. And if we put into the drink extra large amounts of the three vitamins that are needed to make choline, B12, B6, and folic acid, then the liver would make more choline, and that would raise blood choline levels and would amplify the effects of the choline that you're putting into the souvenir. And the other ingredients also have these kinds of amplifying effects. So I would not encourage people to believe that taking anything they can concoct in their basement is going to have this effect. It really, it could be dangerous to do that. One question about the protocol, basically it's a small amount of souvenir that people are taking on a day-to-day basis. How does this work with the rest of their diet? Were there any foods that they were told not to eat, any potential conflicts with, with what somebody's normal diet might be? No, not to my knowledge. You know, you wouldn't think it because, look, the, the souvenir contains DHA, choline, and uridine. But those three compounds are also present in your diet all the time anyhow. It's just the uridine in your diet isn't bioavailable because it's mostly RNA, but it's in the diet. I just wonder if they were tracking that because if, let's say somebody eats a ton of eggs anyway and they're already having elevated choline levels from their baseline diet, if they're taking that into account when they look at the results? Well, I'm not sure it would make much of a difference. I think what you want is what we would call saturating levels of the substrates. But I'm not sure the dose response curve goes on infinitely. Yeah. Down the line, look, what's probably going to happen, I hope, I have no evidence for this, but what I hope will happen is that when this stuff becomes generally available, particularly here in America, where we're kind of experimentally inclined, people will try it on Mondays and Tuesdays and standing on their head and looking at the moon, you know, try all kinds of ways. And data will accumulate about uh, is there a relationship between the high levels through different high levels and the therapeutic or the, the clinical response. That'll happen, but it's not known yet. A couple of things I noticed reading the documents that you sent over. One was that EPA might be a perfectly good stand-in for DHA. I was just sort of wondering about that because, you know, I've talked with people about fish oil plenty before, and those are always sort of thrown around simultaneously, uh, DHA and EPA. You know, from a biochemical perspective, what's the difference between those two? And, you know, is there ever a time when somebody should look for one but not the other? Well, the way the study was done, as you'll see, if, I think if you go to the internet and look up Suvenate, I think it gets the composition, but it contains a certain amount of DHA and a certain amount of EPA. I don't know how they calculated what percent of each to have, but anyhow, it has a certain ratio within it. So what you can say is, well, that's the ratio that was tested, and that's the ratio that works. Now, in terms of your question, would it work as well with more EPA or less EPA? I don't know. Somebody has to do the study and see. I mean, I'm not trying to avoid the question. It's almost like a, an article of faith with me about it, but I've seen it all my life. You just have to have good data before you can make a claim because otherwise, for instance, it used to be the case, I'm sure you've spoken about this, where it was believed that all polyunsaturated fatty acids were good. You had to have plenty of fatty acids. And then it was realized, well, omega-6 and omega-3 aren't the same thing, right? So we kind of, we keep adding knowledge and changing what we're recommending. And again, I don't know the extent to which EPA can substitute for DHA. You know, DHA itself is kind of controversial in this field. There may be a hundred papers I've seen trying to see whether just giving DHA by itself will have an effect on cognition or memory. And it's like 50-50. Many say yes and many say no. I think the reason for that probably is that people start out, uh, as you're implying, with different levels of DHA in their blood based on their diet, based on, you know, do they eat fish. And if their DHA levels are low, then there might be a, a partial deficiency in the brain, which could be corrected by providing supplemental DHA. And as a result, there might be a small improvement in memory. That's just my theory. I think it's not the same giving DHA. It's by no means the same giving DHA or EPA or any of the above. 
to what you're seeing with the Suvinate. I don't think any single nutrient is going to have much of an effect. Right. Because what happens is, as we've been discussing, you have a biosynthetic pathway that critically involves three, let's say, three different compounds. So you're fine. You give one nutrient, so you jack up that one, but then you're immediately limited by the other two. One of the other interesting quotes in there said, those patients who have lost the least cognitive function have the most to gain. Could you unpack that statement a little? Yeah, I think it means it, it tends to work best early in the disease. And again, this was a study in people that did not have Alzheimer's but had prodromal Alzheimer's, which by definition is quite early in the disease. Look, that's what it means maybe is that you have, let's say, a dendrite and there are like a half a dozen dendritic spines coming off it, okay? And if now you're down to two or three and then you're down to one, Maybe the responsiveness is not as great. I'm just speculating on that. But I think there is enough information now to suggest that the earlier people can be caught, the better it is. And now, thank goodness, we do have biomarkers, which really can, I think, help discern which people really are at risk of developing it in the next year or two or three. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very, very much to Dr. Wortman for taking the time for that interview. We had that conversation a couple of months ago now, right after the Athens meeting that he mentioned had taken place. This is an ongoing study. It's going to be continuing over in Europe, and we'll see what happens. Pretty much the whole population of the world would love to know that we've got another effective weapon in the arsenal against Alzheimer's disease. I thought one of the really interesting points in that conversation, which Dr. Wortman underscored a couple of times, was the idea of doing human testing on an entire protocol, not necessarily deconstructing it piece by piece, and thinking that each of the individual components might have efficacy on their own without the complementary effects of the other compounds being studied. Talking about DHA, one of the nutrients within Suvenade, Dr. Wortman asked me to add as an end cap to this interview that just this past week, the European Food Safety Commission has ruled that it's no longer allowed for DHA manufacturers within Europe to claim that DHA benefits cognition because the data don't support that claim. So definitely a fluid environment, both with studies and with regulations. And we'll put a link to that up on the website as well. I must admit, and this is, this is a little embarrassing, this means I did not do my homework well enough, but I did not know, prior to this interview, Dr. Wortman's role in the discovery of melatonin and its effects within the brain, its effects on sleep. But now that I do know, you know who my go-to person is going to be for a future melatonin episode, so don't be surprised to have something like that in the next couple of months. Really hope you enjoyed this one, but let's move along now, as promised, to the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So we talked last week about some of the cognitive benefits of chocolate. And of course, the taste benefits of chocolate are well known to everybody. But what is not actually that well known is that chocolate might also have some benefits for physical exercise performance. This flies in the face of conventional wisdom to a certain extent. And no, you can't get fit by sitting on a couch eating chocolate ice cream. But if you remember last week, I mentioned something called epicatechin, which I'm still not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. But that is one of the flavanol compounds, which is prevalent in dark chocolate. The darker the chocolate, the more of this there is. So that's worth keeping in mind. But scientists is suspecting that there might be some benefits for epicatechin, drafted some mice and they divided those mice into four groups. Those four groups got water, water plus exercise, epicatechin infused water, and finally epicatechin infused water plus exercise. The mice that were exercising did 15 days of exercise on a mouse treadmill, and all of them for those 15 days drank the sort of water that they were getting, whether it was epicatechin infused water or just garden variety water. At the end of this time, they gave these mice an athletic endurance test. The mice who exercised and consumed epicatechins during those 15 days did better. Unsurprisingly, the mice who sat around drinking plain old water and not exercising did worst. And interestingly, the mice who sat around drinking epicatechin infused water but did not exercise at all did almost as well as the mice who drank the regular water but did get the exercise. And all of these mice were getting other food at the time, so it's not like it was epicatechin versus starvation. There seemed to be several things happening within the mice, and as often happens at the end of a mouse study, the poor little mice were sacrificed. But what they found in the hind legs of the mice was that the mice that were given epicatechin had developed more blood capillaries in their leg muscles, and the muscle cells also seem to be generating more mitochondria. Mitochondria, as we've discussed before, are the ATP-producing powerhouses of all of the cells in the body, and cells that need a lot of energy, like muscle cells and brain cells, need even more mitochondria. One additional physiological benefit of epicatechins is that they seem to increase the bioavailability of nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is known to dilate blood vessels, and in so doing, it can increase blood flow to skeletal muscles, which of course helps in exercise. Scientists did a similar study with epicatechins on human bicycle riders. They did not sacrifice the bicycle riders at the end of the study, so breathe a sigh of relief. But once again, over a two-week eating and training regimen, they divided the group so half of them got 40 grams of dark chocolate in their diet, and the other had 40 grams of white chocolate. White chocolate has no epicatechin. 
they ran the test. Then for the following two weeks, they switched. So the people that had got dark chocolate got white. The people that had got white chocolate now get dark. So each of the nine riders would race once for team dark chocolate and once for team white chocolate. The combined results following those two races came out in favor of dark chocolate. The dark chocolate riders were able to ride one-tenth of a mile further, and they consumed a lot less oxygen while they were doing so. One-tenth of a mile further may not sound like a heck of a lot, but this was just a two-minute time trial. So in the course of two minutes, that's worth considering. Overall, the results for the human athletes were not quite as dramatic as those seen in the mouse study, but they're still a lot better than nothing. And if you're looking for excuses to eat some dark chocolate now, you got one more. There's a good write-up on the science behind this, by the way, over at dansplan.com, run by Dan Party, who you may remember as our interview guest on episode 90 of this show. We'll have a link to that up on the website. We like to think of ourselves as a digital speakeasy for brain hackers, but you can call us Smart Drug Smarts. Okay, that is our entire episode number 131. You have made it to the end. Thanks for hanging around until the very end here. And if you liked what you heard, please recommend this podcast to a couple of friends and know that you can find everything that we talked about here online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 131. Last week's episode, as mentioned, was about chocolate and its effects on the brain. And next week, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to have. We've actually got some choices, have a pretty solid interview in the can on diet and cognition, but I don't know if I'm going to be feeling like talking about diet during water fast week. So we may slide that one back a bit. I'm going to make you have to come back on Friday and find out, but it's bound to be an interesting week. I will see you back here next Friday, same time, same podcast, and with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week until then, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smart should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.